All right, hi everyone. Uh, this is Savannah, and this is Red Team Villages Track Two at HacktivityCon 2021. With us today, we have Alvaro. So he's going to be doing a workshop uh, with everyone today, and he's going to be sharing a few resources in the HacktivityCon uh, Discord as well. So I'll go ahead and hand it over to Alvaro to get started. Thank you. Um, so welcome to this uh, workshop. Um, this is CodeQL as an audit oracle, or as I prefer to call it, CodeQL as an audit palantir. I'm a little bit geek with Lord of the Ring and things like that. So my name is Alvaro, Alvaro Muñoz. I'm a tester in social media, um, Twitter, uh, GitHub, etc. I'm a staff security researcher with uh, GitCon and multiple OWASP uh, chapters. Um, so my research is mostly focused on Java technologies and web, te web technologies and especially on those which may lead to remote code execution. Um, so I have probably more than 100 uh, CVs related with uh, remote code execution. And what I'm going to share today is how I found uh, at least 10 of them in my latest um, audit of Apache Dabo. So uh, today I hope that you can learn more about what CodeQL is and why you should learn more about uh, what CodeQL is um how to write codeql queries and also um because codeql is a language that will allow you to find bugs and you can do it in a multiple ways right you can basically integrate that into your into your build pipeline or you can for example use it to do like um what we call variant analysis we will we will do a little bit of that during the workshop or uh, what we are going to focus today is using codeql as an audit oracle which means that you will be doing your manual code review uh, using your um, IDEs and tools of your choice, but then using CodeQL to answer questions about, well, what's the uh, tax surface of, me, of my application? Um, what are the data that I can control, uh, which leads to some um, dangerous things or things like that, right? So um, I have prepared some exercises. Uh, my idea is that this is going to be a hands-on workshop uh, even though it's virtual and it's my first virtual workshop, I don't know how it's going to work on, but the idea is that I'm going to give you time to um, solve some of the exercises that I'm going to propose. So you have um, the um, these exercises and all the repo prepared in this GitHub CodeQL double workshop. You have that link also in the Discord channel if you want to, to check it out. And um, if you're wondering why you should learn CodeQL, uh, one reason, apart from finding um, CVs and, and cool bugs, is that you can actually earn some money uh, with that, right? So, for example, we have uh, this bug bounty program where we are paying generous um, bounties for those that are contrib uh, contributing queries um, and CodeQL, um, yeah, CodeQL queries to our repo for others to use, right? So um, back to the slides, um, the agenda for today is that we are going to do a brief um, theoretical introduction to what CodeQL is. We will see some of the syntax of the language, so we will feel more uh, comfortable with the exercises. And then we will be doing uh, a case study around some um, audit that I did for Apache DAO, right? So that is going to be a hands-on um, case study. We are going to propose some exercises, and I hope that you can um, solve them, and well, if you have any questions, you can always ask questions in the Red Team Village uh, channel in the Discord uh, server. So, um, a, a small disclaimer, I'm not a CodeQL um, engineer, even though I work for GitHub and the GitHub Security Lab, I'm not an expert on, on CodeQL, I'm just a user of CodeQL, and uh, that's probably what most of you are going to be. So I don't know more CodeQL than most of the people that are maybe submitting um, some these queries to the Backpanty program. But with that knowledge of CodeQL, I was able to find very cool bugs in, in applications, for example, like Apache Dabo. So I think this is a pretty uh, useful skill. If you are doing Backpanty from the code review, from the white box um, side of things, and with that, I think that we are ready to jump into what CodeQL is. As I said, I will try to keep this short because I prefer to focus on the hands-on part where you are actually going to learn 
what CodeQL is by uh, by doing it, right? So, well, first of all, CodeQL is not just a language, but it's a language and then some tool chain. Um, as the language uh, is an expressive um, declarative query language, so it's kind of uh, similar to what um, SQL is, right? So if you are familiar with SQL, it allows you to query a database by just uh, writing some, some uh, queries about what you are trying to find, right? So what CodeQL is, is going to treat the code as data, and then it's going to allow you to perform queries, to run queries on that data. So with that, we're going to be able to form um, or look for patterns in the code that can lead to vulnerabilities. So as I said, CodeQL uh, code is not just the language, it's also the, the tool chain, so the CLI and the IDE extensions, for example. And what can we do with CodeQL? Well, I already told you that you can find security bugs and not just security bugs, but any kind of bug because you can uh, ask questions to your code and look for patterns that may not be security related. In this case, we are going to focus, of course, on looking or uh, finding security bugs. Um, it's also very useful to try to, um, well, make your manual code review more precise because normally when you try to look for, for something in the code, you may end up using grep or things like that, even um, abstract syntax tree kind of uh, grep tools. But uh, sometimes you need more powerful uh, tools like being able to do control flow analysis, data flow analysis, or express um, queries or some patterns in some repeatable form that you can uh, run uh, iteratively, iteratively during the, the manual code review. So as I said, we are going to focus on using CodeQL as um, an audit oracle, as a, if you want a Swiss um, army knife, uh, because it's going to give you a lot of power into ways of how to um, find, yeah, patterns basically in the code um, that can lead to remote code execution, or remote code execution or any uh, vulnerabilities. Um, so, about the language itself, it's a logical language, um, which means that we are going to express things in form of um, predicates that evaluates normally to true, false, and that you can combine with uh, logical operators like and, or, not, etc. Um, also, it's a declarative language, which means that um, it's maybe a little bit weird for, for you if you're not familiar with declarative language. As I said, uh, S, uh, SQL is a declarative language. And the main difference between a declarative language and the languages like we are more familiar with, like Java or Python, which are imperative languages, is that in an imperative language, you say how you want to do things, right? You want to iterate through this uh, array, for example, and for, it, uh, for each item, you may want to do some some stuff some i don't know check if the length of some string is something and if it's not something then do something so you are expressing exactly what you want to do in a declarative language uh, what you do is not how you want to do things but actually what you want to do so in in sql for example in sql you express uh well i want to select the user name and the user last name from these tables of, joining with these other tables but you don't you don't tell the engines how you want to combine the tables how you want to uh, iterate through all the different rows in the table you don't do anything like that you just express what you want to do and then the engines and the language will take care of that um codeql is also object oriented this is not very um common in in declarative languages uh, probably so, but it's very powerful in the sense that it's going to give us um, all the benefits from the object-oriented uh, paradigm, like for example, inheritance and encapsulation, and it's going to make these queries more reusable, right? We are going to be able to write that queries in a form that we can reuse parts of the query for other queries or for uh, making it more readable. Um, it's also a read-only language, which means that even though we are going to work with a database, we cannot do anything like update the database or insert into the database. We are just going to be able to um, select and uh, run queries on that database. Um, also, CodeQL comes with a rich library, which is not just for representing the languages you are writing the queries for. Like, for example, if you are writing a query for Java, 
this library will provide you with things like what a, a method is in, in Java, for example, or a method call or an expression and if a statement, things like that. But also it contains a lot of models for common libraries, like for example, Spring or Apache Commons libraries. So you don't have to care about, you know, modeling every single library that is used by your application. So what does a query look like? So um, this is what a very simple uh, query looks like. As you can see, uh, we normally import some libraries. As I said, by importing, for example, the Java library will bring all these um, elements, all these constructs uh, for, the, for the language. Like for example, what an if statement is in Java or what a block is in Java. And also we will have three um, three statements, right? So we will have the from statement, uh, the where statement, and then also the select statement. So as you can see, this is very similar to SQL. Um, in this case, the order is a little bit different. We will start with the from one, but the idea is uh, if you want to think about CodeQL uh, similar to SQL, uh, what you can do is, for example, think about we have a table uh, with all the if statements in the program. Then you have another table with all the block statements in the program. And then what we are doing here is we are selecting from these tables, but then we are applying some constraints in order to narrow down the results. Because if you get all the if statements and all the block statement, all the blocks in the Java program, then what you're going to do is basically get um, a huge amount of results. And what we want to do is, uh, well, in this case, we want to look for all the um, if statements which have a then block which has no statement. So it's an empty then block. Um, in this case, we are doing this by checking that the then block of the if statement um, has no uh, a number of statements equal to zero. And then for those if statements and block that satisfies these logical predicates, where we are uh, going to do is basically select the if statements. So um, what are the building blocks of a query? So I would say that there are two main building blocks apart from those uh, three main statements like the from, select, and where. And the other building blocks are, first of all, the predicates, which you can think about as if they were uh, functions, but they are like logical functions. So we will see what's the, different, uh, the difference and also uh, the classes that we will see later. So um, as I said before, we can put all the logic, all the logic within the where block, or we can move that into a predicate. Um, this way we are doing the, the uh, query more uh, reusable maybe, and also more readable. In this case, what we are doing here is we are um, writing a predicate which, uh, which checks if a given block of code is empty or not. And it's going to do that by checking that the number of statements within that block is equal to zero. So instead of putting all of the logic within the where statement, what we are going to do is we are going to use our is empty predicate that we define here. And then we are checking that the if statement then block is empty or not. And then only for those um, then blocks, um, we will select them if they are empty. Uh, the other um, the other building block are the classes. As I said, uh, CodeQL is an object-oriented language, which means that well, we have inheritance, we have um, encapsulation, and that's very useful for expressing um, things within CodeQL and also for making it more reusable. So for example, in this case, what we can do is an empty block is a, um, a kind of block, right? It's a specialized kind of block. And in similarly to what we have in object-oriented language, languages where we have things like the constructor, in CodeQL, we have um, the characteristic predicate. The characteristic predicate, you can think as if it was a, a constructor, is where we define what makes this block different from the class that we are extending. So for example, what makes an empty block different from a regular block? In this case, the characteristic of an empty block is that the number of statements is uh, zero. And because we are talking about classes and, and this is a member predicate instead of a regular predicate, then we will refer to the object as this, as we do in many other um, object-oriented languages. 
So with that, we can uh, rewrite this query by saying that the then block of a given if statement is an instance of a different of this empty block class. So this may look a little bit confusing for now, but I think that it will get more clear when we do the, the exercises. Um, so a different way of expressing the same um, the same pattern is saying that okay we have uh, we are selecting all the if statements and we are selecting all the empty blocks and then we are um, selecting just the empty blocks which are then blocks of a given if statement. So as you can see in in CodeQL there are always many ways of expressing the same pattern. Normally some of them are more efficient than others, but in in general terms. Um, it's very flexible language. So um, what we are going to do, as I said, is use CodeQL as, um, as a tool during our manual code review, right? So in this case, we are not talking about CodeQL as an automatic um, vulnerability finding tool that you put in your pipeline and then find vulnerabilities every time that you submit a new PR that you can do, of course. But in this case, what we want to do is use it as a tool that we are going to manually um, invoke and use when we have questions about what we are reading in a code review, right? And as I said, I prefer to call it or to use the Palantir uh, metaphor. So um, you can think about CodeQL as a very powerful Palantir, which will show you many things, but if you don't use it uh, wisely, if you just um, use very fast queries, then you can get too many results and then it will not be that useful for you. So you have to um, express those questions in a way that uh, they are, um, that they will provide value, right? So we will see some examples like, for example, normal or common questions that you may have during a code review. Well, first of all, what's my attack surface? What are the inputs that I can influence? Um, for example, I can have um, questions about, well, what are the parts of the application that are more dense in terms of dangerous um, APIs or dangerous things? Um, what does my user control data um, reach within the application? Does it reach a, a given function or it, does it, it get used by some third party libraries or it's just used by the application itself? So things like that, we will be able to um, formalize and express with CodeQL. So as I said, um, we are going to use Apache Double as a case study. And uh, if you are not familiar with Apache Double, um, well, it's um, an RPC framework, a high performance RPC framework. So basically, it's just a building block in an application. It's not an application itself. It's not like a web application or, or a framework, in this case, a, a web framework. It's more like, uh, well, we have um, some, for example, microservices that we want to expose, and we want some, some customers to invoke those microservices. And then what we can do is use um, Double as the communication and RPC method. So the way that the client or the um, um, customer will invoke methods in the service or in the provider using the double uh, terminology. It's a very popular um, application or framework in, in Apache. It has 36,000 star, which is a lot for a Java application. And is one of the most um, um, popular Apache projects because it's actually one of the pin ones. Um, so, as I said, uh, in Davo, what you are going to do is, well, you are going to define your, your logic, your microservice, for example, and then you are going to expo expose it uh, to the consumers by using a provider, right? So the consumer is going to invoke methods in the service using uh, or exposed as a provider. So the way it works is similar to RMI, where we have a registry and a provider will uh, register itself to the registry. So when a consumer wants to invoke a service or reach some service, it's going to consult the registry and it's going to um, get the address and the way of invoking the, the methods that are exposed by that provider. And then it's going to be able to invoke it directly using the double protocol. Okay, um, so when I started looking at Davo, I found a, 
three CVs um, from, 90, from 2019 to 2020. And all of them, well, the first two were related with the way that the RPC invocation was um, decoded. And because the arguments for that RPC invocation were serialized, where um, there was uh, some deserialization that can be abused, right? So these two first CVs are related with the deserialization of, in, of the, an RPC invocation. And uh, well, you have to know that Davo by default uses the Hessian 2 um, deserialization format. It does not use the Java native deserialization. But Hessian is similar in the way that it can lead to remote code execution if you control the data that is going to be deserialized. So the third um, CV was a little bit different. In this case, it was not related with the DAO protocol, but actually the HTTP protocol. So there are multiple ways of exposing providers or services to the consumers, to the clients. So one of them, and the default one, is using the DAO protocol, which is a binary uh, protocol. And then you have many others. So let me see if I can show you some of them. Um, there you go. Protocol here. And then you can use, for example, what the DAO protocol I told you is the binary protocol that we will be analyzing. But you can also use the RMI protocol, HTTP protocol, the Hessian one, uh, even Redis or Memcached and uh, Thrift as well. So there are a number of ways of uh, invoking remote um, services. Uh, the, this CV was related when uh, using the HTTP, uh, HTTP protocol because, well, it was using the Spring HTTP um, <clears throat> invokers or remote invokers, which um, uses Java deserialization underneath. So that was the reason of this CV. Well, during this um, manual code review, I found some new CVs um, and I was able to get pre-authentication, remote code execution in a number of ways, um, directly invoking um, the providers or indirectly by poisoning some, some servers that are called configuration centers that we will explain later. And what we are going to do is, um, well, I use CodeQL as my personal um, uh, audit oracle, I would say. And then uh, what I will try to share with you today is how I use CodeQL in this particular application, in this particular code review, and how I was able to find these CVs. OK, so with that, um, let's check. Let me check very quickly the Discord channel to see if we have any questions. OK, no questions so far. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to set my um, VS Code environment, right? So first of all, um, if you want to do or follow this hands-on exercise, go to this repo, clone it, and then open VS Code, and then just open um, the workspace within this uh, workshop, right? So you just click on the workspace, code workspace, and it will open all the exercises that are prepared for you. So the next thing that you have to do is what well, you have to have the CodeQL extension installed. So if you haven't installed it yet, uh, go ahead and, and install the CodeQL ex um, extension. And once that you install the CodeQL extension, you will see this um, new icon here for the CodeQL extension. And one of, the, <clears throat> one of the things that you can do is basically um, import a database. So as we said, CodeQL is going to treat your code, uh, your code as a database. So one of the first steps that you have to do is take your code and generate a database out of it. So, there is documentation about that. We are not going to, to do that in as part of this um, of this workshop because I already gave you the database prepared. So go to um, add a CodeQL database, click on from an archive, and then select the double underscore two seven eight, as you have explained in the. Well, one second. I think. 
Yeah. So I'm gonna switch my screen now because I was I can send I can share my whole screen, so I have to se select just one application every time, and I'm gonna use this now. It's gonna be some so. Okay, so now you can see my my VS Code. Um, so what I was basically saying is that you have to install the CodeQL extension. Then uh, you have to click on the QL icon, and then from an archive, click here and import the double underscore two seven eight version of the code, which was the version that I um, audited. So with that, you will see here that it's adding the database from the archive. And now what you have to do is select set current database and then point it to the, uh, you will see the check mark here to verify that you have selected the database. So with that, you can go back to the workspace and there is this hello world um, uh, QL and to run it, just right click on any part of the screen and then run code QL, run the query. So this is a, a very simple one, but it's running on our on our database. And as you can see, we're, in this case, we are just saying hello, ActivityCon. And with that, I think we are ready to start the, the workshop. Let me see if we have any questions so far. OK, no questions. So I'm going to now switch to this playground QL that I will be using to, um, to play with CodeQL. And the first thing that I wanted to do is uh, basically um, repeat what we do with predicates and with um, with classes. And what we are going to do is, okay, first of all, we are going to select all the methods in our Java application, right? For that, what we are going to do is select from the method table, we are going to select all the methods, right? So we are going to select method and we are going to give it a name, like for example, method or just M or whatever. And with that, if I run this query, normally the first time that you will run a query, it will take more time because it will cache a lot of stuff. And then um, next queries are going to run much faster than the, than the first one. So this one will take a few seconds and actually it's going to select maybe thousands of methods. And that explains why it's, why it's a little bit slower. And as you can see here, we have almost uh, 250,000 results. Uh, we can click on any of them and that will take us to the source code where this, for example, this method is defined. And this is the way uh, that we can navigate the code. So back to our playground, uh, what we can do is, for example, add some, some logic about what methods we, we want to select. So imagine that we want to select only those methods that are annotated with a given Java annotation. So for that, what we can do is say, okay, it exists. What we are doing with the exist um, with the exist operator is basically introduce a new variable. So we are going to introduce a new variable, which is going to be an annotation, and we are going to call it a. And now we will use the pipe to specify um, the conditions, right? So we are looking for an annotation so that our method, in this case, method, not M, if we get an annotation from our method, this will be our the annotation that we selected, right? So with that, we can select uh, only methods that have an annotation, and then we can select, for example, the method and the annotation. Well, the annotation is, we cannot select it from here, unless that we do it in a different way. Like for example, so in this different format of the same predicate, what we are uh, saying is we are not introducing the variable within the work clause. What we are doing is introducing the variable at the beginning in the from statement. So we are selecting from the method table and from the annotation table. And we are only selecting those methods which have an annotation so that we get an annotation and that annotation correspond to existing annotation in the annotation uh, table. 
With that, now we will be able to select both the annotation and the method. So now if we run this query, we will see that we get fewer results. Um, now we have 13,000 results. And as you can see, we get the annotation, uh, the method, and the annotation that the code, uh, the method was annotated with. As I said, we can move that into a predicate. So I suggest that you follow this exercise with me and in your VS code. And for example, we can call it like uh, has or is annotated maybe. And for that, we are going to check if a given method is annotated or not. So in this case, we are going to say that exists an annotation. And that the uh, method M get an annotation equals the annotation. So what we can do now is rewrite or refactor this query so that we say something like um, is annotated and then we pass our, let's call it M just because it's shorter. So what we are basically saying is exactly what we did before, but now we are using a predicate and we are making our code and our query uh, reusable. So, um, this is one way of making it reusable using predicates. And the other way of making it reusable is uh, by using a class, so object-oriented. So we can say, like, for example, annotated method, extends method. And then, um, because this is a class, what we have to do is define a characteristic predicate, as I explained before, which is basically, or you can think about it as if it was the constructor of um, a class in an object-oriented language. So it has the same name as the class, in this case, annotated method. It has no parameters, it's like the default um, constructor in Java, for example. And then here, what we have to do is specify what makes any method an annotated method. And that is that the annotated method should have an annotation. So now we have two ways of introducing um, the annotation. We can introduce a local variable as we did here. Like for example, we can do something like exist an annotation. And this is completely valid or using this more um, object oriented approach, we can introduce the annotation as a field. Right, and now we don't have to introduce this local variable because we have a field for that. And then what we can do is, instead of using a predicate, we just select the annotated methods. We don't need a word statement now because we are selecting from a um, table which contains all the annotated methods. So we now have created like a new table. If you want to use this, um, this um, regular database um, analogy, so now what we can do is um, we can select that and that will give us a list of all the annotated method. And we can also uh, use this uh, object-oriented approach to define uh, member predicates. Like for example, I may want to have a method which return the annotation name. And we can do that using, uh, for example, well, in this case, we have the annotation, we get the type of the annotation, and then we we get the name of the annotation. Um, there is no return statement like that in GodQL, and the way that you can do that is assigning it to a, a special variable that is called result. And now, for example, we can select both the method, and uh, the method will have now um, a member uh, method with will be a get um get annotation name so if we now run this query we should get similar results but using a completely different approach i normally prefer to use uh, classes and object-oriented um, 
approach because that makes your query much more reusable. And with that, I think that we can go back to the slides and check the first exercise. Okay, give me one second. Um, I'm gonna try to share my whole screen again. We had some problems before and that's why I was not doing it, but that is going to be much more convenient. So let me see if I can share. You can see the browser and the problem before was that if I change the screen, yeah, it was. it's not rendering correctly. So I am sorry, I cannot do that. And I have to share just one screen. So back to um, back to the slides. Um, these are probably not. Well, I can just close this. I'm sorry about these technical uh, problems. Um, so CodeQL as an audit oracle in here. Okay. Let me see. Okay, you can, you can now see my screen. Perfect. So uh, the first exercise is going to be identify the attack surface because that's normally what you want to do when you do a manual code review. You want to see what pieces of the application you are going to be able to, to touch, to, to knock. So um, there is a class already available in the CodeQL libraries, which is called, um, well, this is the namespace, SAML, code, Java, uh, data flow, flow sources. And then you have this class, the remote flow source, which represents uh, exactly that. So a remote source, um, something that a user can control. That can be an HTTP request parameter. It can be um, some network packets, some maybe some DNS reverse uh, resolution, anything that an attacker may be able to control. And what I'm asking in this exercise is, well, I'm giving you uh, a way of listing all the remote flow sources with this uh, snippet of code, but I want to, I want you to exclude those, uh, those sources that are located in test files. So the way I normally do that is exclude those sources which have a location and the, the file for that location has a path matching this um, regular expression here. And then I want to select not just the source itself, but also the enclosing class and the source type. So you have um, the workshop MD file here. And what you can do is go to the first exercise. You will find here the, the boilerplate. So you can use that to create your own um, query. And if you want to cheat a little bit, you have the solution here, right? So I will give you like five minutes uh, in order to try to um, create this, this query. This is, should give you 10 results, and then we will continue from there.
panel. Apparently, there were some problems with the repo and I didn't got the, uh, or you may not get the submodule uh, for CodeQL. And then you may have some errors about resolution of CodeQL. If that's the case, uh, just go and clone the CodeQL repo, which is GitHub CodeQL, and just clone this repo within the uh, CodeQL double workshop repo. Right. So you should get something like, um, well, actually, you can't see my screen because of this problem. But the idea is that you will get the CodeQL repo, and within that, just clone the CodeQL repo. Right. Um, so I will uh, move on and continue with uh, showing you the answer for this exercise. So let me share. Um, share my VS code again, and that should be this one. Okay, one second to verify that it is set. Okay, so um, so the hint that I gave you in the repo was basically the boilerplate for this exercise. And well, I told you that you can basically select all the sources by doing something like this. And this will give you all the sources in this particular application, in Apache, in Apache Double, at least all the sources that CodeQL know about. Right, so let's wait for the query to complete. And in the meantime, what we wanted to do was narrow down those sources so that the location of the source, so we can do get location. By the way, um, even if you are not familiar with CodeQL, so, um, the auto completion in VS Code is very useful. So for example, you have a source and just by entering get, you will see a list of things that you can get for that particular type. In this case, for a remote flow source, we can get, for example, the location or the source type. So in this case, we care about the location. And again, if we type get, we will get um, ideas about what we can query for this particular type. In this case, we are interested in the path of the file. So we get the file and from here, again, we can get things like the absolute path or in this case, maybe more um, relevant to use the relative path. So with that, we can get um, the relative path and then we can use CodeQL matches and express our condition that was uh, SRC test. And then as you can see, this is not a pure regular expression. If you want to use a pure uh, regular expression like with wildcards, etc., then you have to do um, the regular expression match, the regexp match. If you just use the matches, it's similar, but it just uh, it's more similar to um, the wildcards in um, the wildcards in SQL, for example. So with that, we have uh, the location, but we want to exclude those ones. So those sources, which location or the file of the location, and in this case, the path of the file of the location of that source does not match with this um, pattern here, will be selected. And we wanted to select not just this, not just the uh, the source, but also the source enclosing class. Um, so in order to get to the enclosing class, we have to get to the enclosing callable first, which is the enclosing method. And from here, we can use the declaring type, which will be the, um, the enclosing class. And last but not least, we were asking for the source type. So if we get into source, and again, we type get, we see that there is a get source type, which is uh, tell us a little bit about what kind of source it is. Um, so with that, I don't know why this one is taking so long, but I'm gonna run our improved version and see if we can get it to run faster this time. 
I will check if the problems were solved in the channel. Um, okay. Okay, um, so as I said in the exercise, we should get 10 results, and that's what we are getting. And if we can see the results, um, well, one of them or two of them actually get a host name. So those are reverse DNS lookups are explained in the source type. Um, then we have something like get content, which seems to be the content of um, an HTTP response. So maybe when connecting to a web service we are able or CodeQL is considering the response from that um, the body or the content of that response as an entry point for an application and then we have a few more like for example we have a request URI in an HTTP self-led request another uh, request get input stream which should be the body of an HTTP request and a bunch more but there are very few and this is not very useful um, usual in CodeQL. Normally, when you review, for example, a web application, you will see normally like in the order or maybe hundreds of, of sources. And the reason for that is that um, Davo is not a regular uh, web application, uh, for example. It's just a framework. So um, in this case, let me go back to the slides for a second. So if we um, check the, the architecture again, and this is one tip when you are doing manual code review, you want to see what are the entry points of, of your application, the, the attack surface. So if you are talking with an RPC framework, for example, an RPC framework, um, well, you want to make sure that you model these entry points, all the arrows that look into what you want to attack. In this case, it's more you see to attack the provider which are exposing the services and are going to be normally always online than the consumers that may not be always online so normally what i do is check the architecture of the application that i'm reviewing to see what are the entry points so here there is some sort of network connection that we are not uh, that codeql is not uh, familiar with and we need to model that in order to be able to identify the entry points. So if we go to the Dabo uh, documentation, um, you will see that Dabo works with different transport layers, right? So back here, what we want to model is this. And if we go to the Dabo transporter documentation, you can see that it can work with three different underlaying network libraries. So one of them is Netty, the other one is uh, Mina, and the other one is Grizzly, as you can see here. So these are the libraries or the frameworks that are used by Dabo to um, set up or um, establish a network connection and then pass the bytes from the network socket into the application. So if we want to um know what's the attack surface of Davo, we need to model some of these libraries right so um, because netty is the the default one um i'm gonna do a very brief introduction to what netty is so we have the network socket and then um, netty defines what is called the channel pipeline um this is nothing else that a number of different inbound handlers that are chained together and that is, are going to prepare the request to be handled by the application. Then in the application, it will perform the application logic. And then at some point, it will return the response of the application. And in order to prepare that for the network protocol, in this case, the double protocol, is going to go through a number of outbound handlers. So if we want to model this, uh, we want to identify the channel inbound handler methods as an entry point to the application a method that introduces um, user control or attacker control data. If you go to the documentation of Neri, you will see that there are a few methods that can do that. Uh, one of them is in the channel inbound handler class, 
the one that we see here. And what we want to model as an entry point of our application is the second argument to the channel read or channel read zero methods. And then reading more about Neri, I also found this byte uh, to message decoder that is actually a subclass of channel inbound handler. So it's a, a specialized type of inbound handler, which uh, define a decode and decode last methods, uh, which takes a byte buffer in the second argument. And we also want to model those um, as entry points to our application, right? So this is going to be our second exercise, right? So what we want to do is create a new source. Uh, and we are going to do that by extending the remote flow source. As we saw before, CodeQL is an object-oriented language, so we can create an specialization of a remote flow source. And then in the characteristic predicate, we are going to define what makes our source different from the other remote flow sources, right? So um, going back to the repo, uh, which should be here, if you go to the exercise two, I'm gonna give you um, a model. Well, this is the boilerplate for a remote source. Uh, in this case, I call it Neti source. And then, uh, because I don't want you to remember the these uh, class names and these namespaces, etc., I'm also gonna give you the boilerplate to model those APIs. So what I'm gonna do here, for example, is I'm creating a channel inbound handler class, which extends a class. And this represents the channel inbound handler class. So it's a class which um, extends or implements a class called IO Neti channel, uh, channel inbound handler. And then we are defining a new type of method, which is called channel read method. And this method is um, described or the characteristic of this method is that the name is one of channel read, channel read zero or message received. And then the declaring type of this method, so the, the, the class of this method is an instance of the channel inbound handler type that we defined previously. So this is the way that we model APIs in CodeQL. Normally you can put the class uh, in, one, um, in one class and then the method in a different class or you can put them together, but this make it more reusable. So later in your audit, maybe you want to model a different method of this class, and then you don't have to uh, repeat this, this code here. You just have to um, say that the declaring type of that other method is the same channel inbound handler. So we have the model here for the channel inbound handler and the channel, uh, sorry, the model here for the channel inbound handler methods and the model here for the byte to message decoder, decode and decode last methods. So uh, with that, what I wanted you to do is create a netty source um, where the source is gonna be the second parameter to any of these classes, of these methods, right? So again, I'm gonna give you five minutes for that um, and I will do that with you later. Okay, so see you in five minutes.
Okay, and we are back from that exercise break. Um, so what I did was uh, changing back to VS Code and then I copy from the repo hints, um, well, um, the models that I described before. So the model for the channel inbound handler, the model for the byte to message decoder class uh, methods, decode and decode class, and then the boilerplate that I also gave you for a new implementing a new remote flow source. Uh, then uh, copying also from the previous exercise, I imported the flow source, the flow sources uh, module so that we can use the remote flow source. And then, um, well, I basically copied also this from, from the previous exercise in order to exclude those um, sources from, from the test files and also not just to find the source, but also the enclosing class and the uh, source type. So with that, um, what we want to do is find uh, a method, right? So a method that is what we want to ident identify as uh, the source now is the second argument for any of these decode, decode last, channel read, channel read zero, or message received methods. So what we are going to say is that it uh, exists a method, M, so that this method is an instance of either of either the decode method or m is an instance of the other one that was channel read uh, method right uh, we want to make sure that this is between parentheses and then now what we have method that is either a decode method or a channel read method now, the next thing that we want to do is we want to select the second argument or the second parameter to this method as the entry point to this application. So what we are going to do is say that the method get parameter uh, one because it's zero based indexed is uh, our source. And because we are uh, working on a, uh, extending a remote flow source, our source is this in this case. So um, if you see there is an error here, and this basically says that um, this um, value here, which is a, a parameter, as you can see here, is not of the same type as this, which is um, a remote flow source, which is a data flow node. So if we click and enter here, we can express this um, node as, in this case, a parameter because what we are trying to do is match a parameter. So with that, we have a netty source which represents the second argument to either the decode method or the channel read method. Now, if we run this query, we should get all the places within Dabo where um, the network bytes, uh, the network data is decoded or, or enters the application. And that is going to be the best place to start our audit because that's the data that we can control. That's the data that we can send to any application using uh, Dabo. Right, so let's format this a little bit. And what's going on here? Is this empty? Let me close the window. This seems to be some VS Code issue, maybe. So this should be faster because uh, now it's cached. Okay, so there seems to be some error here, uh, not showing an empty the results. Hmm. Last chance. Let's close everything here. Are you getting the results, uh, the ones that are following the, the workshop? Let me check in the chat. Um, 
Okay, this seems to be some VS Code issue because it's showing the the panel, but the panel is empty for whatever reason. Um, so uh, in these cases, what should we do in a live demo? Um, pray to the demo gods? Maybe? Too late for that, I guess. So um, I want to close the workspace because that seems to be related with the workspace with VS Code. Open it again. I'm sorry because I'm, I'm getting a lot of troubles and selecting the workspace again, which then we should have to select the database maybe again, or is already selected. Let's wait for the workspace to, to load and the activate all the extensions in VS Code, etc. And yeah, it's here. So select as the current database, back to the queries, um, back to our playground query, and then let's cross fingers and see if VS Code uh, wants to behave. So there's no issues with the query. Uh, it's basically some issue showing the results. Otherwise, I will just show you the results from the uh, slides, but that should work. Now, the problem is that because I opened the workspace, again, there is nothing cached, and it has to run the, the query from the very beginning. And that is going to be a little bit more um, well, slow. But uh, in the meantime, what I can show you are some tricks, for example, um, when you are not familiar with CodeQL syntax or what methods are defined for a given, a given type, uh, for example, for, uh, for method, you can navigate to the declaration of this method. And that will take you to the uh, QLL library. And that is where the method is defined. So you have access to the, all the source code of the um, CodeQL. Uh, and here you can see that, for example, we get the get signature, um, the get source declaration, all the methods are uh, defined here. Also, just by holding uh, the cursor here, we get some nice um, documentation about what are these, um, what's the, what this method for, right? So now we've got the results. As you can see, I didn't change anything, so it seems to be uh, back in the VS Code, maybe extension or maybe VS Code itself. Anyway, now we have six results, which are um, the places in Davo where we get um, data from the network. So as a manual code reviewer, what I would do now is, okay, this is the byte buffer that I take from the network and what is going on with this buffer. It's going to be um, initialized, uh, wrapped, in, in this channel buffer, uh, this message here is going to be decode. So what uh, this decode method is. So I'm gonna start exploring the application and, and I'm gonna start uh, seeing where my untrusted data can reach. In this case, I want to follow, for example, this decode method and see where it takes us. Um, so that's, that's what we wanted to do with this first exercise. So let me switch back to the slides. Um, so stop screen, share the slides, which should be um, these ones. And back here, uh, we can see that we got six results using this query. So those are the results that we were expecting. So um, as I said, Davo is using some abstraction, right? Because it can use either Netty, uh, Mina, or Grizzly uh, network layers or network libraries. So no matter what network library is used, those are going to end up, if you remember, I saw you that it was calling the codec decode method. That is the exchange codec decode method. And that is going to end up calling the Davo codec decode party method. So in this case, this is going to be our um, 
the source that um, is going to be uh, the source either, no matter if the um, implementation of that was using Netty, Mina, or Grizzly. So normally you will have to uh, model all the libraries, Netty, Mina, or Grizzly, for example, in these cases. But in this case, because Davo is abstracting them and using some service provider interface and SPI, then what we are going to do is instead of considering these Netty methods like the decode or the code last or the channel read method as our entry points, what we are going to do is treat the input stream to this decode body uh, as our entry point, because that is going to be the entry point no matter what network transporter is used. And then we have another abstraction that is used by, by Dabo. So um, as I told you, Dabo is using the Hessian 2 um, serialization uh, algorithm protocol. But uh, actually, you can configure different protocols, not just the the Hessian one. If you go to the documentation and go to serialization, then you see that it can use Hessian, uh, Java serialization, uh, compacted. And I think that this one is not even complete because you can also use Creo and some other like uh, fast JSON, I think, and some other uh, serialization. So you can uh, use one of the um, serializations, but, but the default one will be Hessian too. Now, um, the way that uh, Dabo works is that um, it will take the serialization type that is configured for that provider, and then it will return a serialization um, object. And then when calling the deserialize method, we are not actually deserializing any data. What we are doing is we are uh, wrapping our input stream, the one that is uh, user controllable, with uh, some class that extends from object input class. So what we do here is, OK, if uh, we are using Hessian, for example, as the serialization type, then uh, when we use the deserialize method of this uh, serialization object, then we will be returning an Hessian to object input instance. So it's basically an abstraction. And what we want to do is, uh, OK, um, let me see. Uh, this is going to be our source, uh, the entry point for our application, no matter what network uh, library is used then uh, we want to have um, a taint step, meaning that if the input stream is tainted, it's user controllable, we want to consider this object input as tainted as well, because, well, that's just a wrapper around our input stream. And then our real sync for the serialization vulnerabilities is going to be this read object or these read methods. So again, um, we are now going to do um, a variant analysis. And what, uh, what we are going to do is uh, using the data flow library, and we are considering the is uh, input stream as the entry point, uh, our, the source of the of this data flow. And then we will need some um, taint step that I will explain you now what a taint step uh, is and how we can model that with CodeQL. And then our sync, uh, which is basically the method that we want to check if untrusted data gets into that method will be the qualifier of this read uh, object, this read uh, attachment, this read event methods in the object input class. So before that, we need to understand what a uh, taint tracking is, what data flow analysis is, and how we can model that with a uh, CodeQL. So basically, uh, taint tracking is the um, the form of emulating a program running, but statically. So we are not running the, pro, uh, the program. We are basically emulating this program uh, running. And for that, we are going to track the data from the source, from the place that we identified as the source. And we are going to see how it propagates through different variable assignments, through uh, different uh, method calls and things like that and see if it reaches the sync, which is the place that we want to, to watch and monitor for untrusted data to get into that particular um, method. Um, for doing that, uh, well, we need to use the time tracking module of CodeQL. And what we need to do is basically configure that module. And basically configure the ten tracking module basically means, say, what are our sources? What are our syncs? And optionally, we want to define some additional taint steps, which are edges between these nodes and sanitizers. So um, as you can see here, let me go back to the previous slide. 
there may be some disconnected uh, nodes in this um, in this graph here. So basically, the way that we treat um, data flow analysis is by considering the application as a directed graph, where we have a source and we have different nodes, and we will see uh, what are the edges between these nodes, and we will see if there is a path that goes from the source following different edges into the sink. As you can see here, now there is no uh, way of getting from the source to the sink. But now if we define, uh, for example, a new edge here or a new edge here, now we will enable uh, data flow to, to flow into the sink. Like for example, these two edges here. So we can define that with 10 steps. Uh, we will see how now. And then we can also do um, define sanitizers as part of this 10 tracking configuration. So sanitizers are going to be a nodes um, where are going to prevent um, um, where flowing of the of the taint tracking module. So, for example, if we identify this node as a sanitizer, then these two edges will be just discarded, and then uh, this path over here will be discarded because now there is no path between the source and the sink flowing through. For example, this node here. So again, we have to define what our uh, our sources are, what our sinks are, uh, if we want to define some additional edges, some additional 10 steps, and also if we want to define some sanitizers. So um, the way that we can do that with CodeQL is basically uh, this. So this looks like a lot of code, but it's just uh, a boilerplate that you are going to copy paste like 99% of the cases. So what we are doing here is we are extending the 10 tracking configuration because we want to create our own um, configuration. The characteristic predicate is just going to be one single uh, string that is going to, the only requirement for this string is it has to be unique. And then we can override different predicates. So the two mandatory ones are the is source and the is sync, where we are going to define what our sources and sinks are. And then we can also, um, identify uh, additional 10 step or additional uh, edges, right? And then the rest of the boilerplate is gonna be, well, we need to import the 10 tracking module. We need to uh, import the path graph module as well. We need some metadata here to tell CodeQL how to evaluate uh, the results. And then uh, we need to select from the configuration of the 10 tracking module, uh, a source, a sync, and then the constraint is going to be uh, well, we need a flow which flows from the source to the sink, right? So again, this is going to be boilerplate, 99% of the type of, of the cases. And actually, I'm going to give you that as part of the uh, third exercise. So this exercise is going to be um, about finding all the variants of the CV 2020-1199-5. Uh, 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 we are going to use the 10 tracking library, as I explained to you, and we should get eight variants, eight, uh, eight results. Uh, I'm gonna give you this boilerplate. And then what you have to do is define our sources, our sinks, and our taint step. And now if you remember, uh, let me go back to this slide. Um, our source is going to be the, the second argument to the decode body method. Uh, then we need a 10 step, which means that uh, we are going to connect the second argument to the deserialized method to the return value of the deserialized method. We are going to create a net between these two nodes. And then we are going to define the sync as the uh, qualifier for the read methods. So uh, going forward, we are going to do this variant analysis, again, uh, identifying these decode body um, arguments or parameters, sorry, as the entry point. We need this um, new 10 step between argument one and the return value. And then we want to define the sync as the read method. So with that and this boilerplate, I'm also giving you the APIs model for the decode body, which is our source for the read methods, which are our sinks, and for the deserialized method, which is our um, 10 step, okay? So with that, um, let's give five minutes to do the exercise.
Okay, and we're back. And um, so what I did basically is I copied the boilerplate that I gave you. So we have the models for the, the code body, uh, which is going to be our source. We have the, the model for the read methods, which are those methods defined on any class extending from or implementing the object input uh, interface and then uh, call read something. Then we have the model for our deserialized method, uh, which is going to be our 10th step. Remember, we need to connect the second argument to the return value. And then we have, uh, remember, all this boilerplate that looks a little bit complex, but it's just um, it's just the, um, the boilerplate to define the source, the sync, and the additional 10th step. Everything else is basically boilerplate. So as you can see here, what I did for the source is I uh, create or identify a double codec decode body method, which is the one that I defined here, and consider the first and the second arguments as the parameters, as the um, as the source itself. Then we created the is is sync predicate where I define any method access, and this is the way um, within CodeQL. Uh, this is the way that CodeQL refers to an invocation, to a call invocation. So instead of calling it just like method call, it's called method access, but it's basically an invocation of a method. So in this case, um, the method being accessed is an instance of the object input read method. Remember, is any method starting with read. And then uh, the qualifier for that method is going to be our sync. So the only part that is left is considering um, the call to the deserialized method as a 10 step from the first argument to the return value. So we identify method calls to the deserialized method. And then we say that the first argument is going to be the first node in, in this edge, because remember that a 10 step is an edge in this graph. It's not a node like, for example, the source or the sync or the sanitizer. So for the additional 10th step, we need to define two nodes, which um, in, in turn will define an edge. And the first um, node is going to be the first, uh, the second argument to the deserialized method. And the second node in this, uh, in this edge is going to be the return value. So the way to define or to select the return value of a method access is to, uh, to select the method access itself. So with that, we are going to select all the insecure configurations where we have a flow from the source to the sink, uh, where the source and the sinks are going to be defined by our team tracking configuration. So if we run this query, um, again, this may look like a little bit, um, well, we have this problem again. One second. Um, Oh, this time it worked. Okay, so we got uh, eight different results, and all of these are real variants of the CV that I uh, selected. So um, basically, we have two of them um, in the decodable RPC invocation, and those are the ones that were identified previously, or the ones that we were modeling, the CVs that were reported in 2020. So we have some input stream here, which is flowing uh, into this decodable RPC invocation constructor here. And then um, we are calling the decode method for this decodable RPC invocation, which take us to this decode method. And we can follow how the data propagates from the source to the sink. Like we now call this other decode overload and then we get into this uh, parameter here, and now we get into the in read attachment. Since we selected the in uh, the qualifier for any read um, whatever um, method as our sync, this is a real vulnerability. And this is actually the one that was reported. So it's uh, still reported because the way that Davo fixed this issue is by enabling an opt-in filter for uh, users to define either an allow list or a block list to protect against um, 
uh, visualization gadgets, but the flow is still here. So uh, that means that if developers or the users don't enable this opt-in filter, these are still exploitable uh, vulnerabilities. So we have these two in the decodable RPC invocation, one in the read attachments and the other one, I think it's in the read object, which are the arguments for the RPC invocation. But then we also got some other results and some of them are in the decodable RPC result. We have a few of them here, like for example, uh, this one, let me go a little bit. So here we are creating a decodable RPC result instead of our decodable RPC invocation. And this was pretty interesting because the way that double works is that it opens a socket and then it listens in that socket. But you can send a request like an invocation or you can send a packet saying that that packet is a response. Even if, it, if there is no previous invocation matching that response. So basically, um, well, I will show you now how the packet looks like, but uh, in the bytes here, uh, we control both the header and the body of this packet. And there is some header saying, okay, this is um, the deserialization protocol that should be used. And these, for example, these bits of the header are going to be um, the status of the request or the response. And then if the status equals this response okay, means that whatever we have received is our response. Again, regardless of um, and previous invocation being identified. So you can send a response without a previous invocation. And we, if you select the bits of the packet correctly, if you just uh, craft the uh, a packet uh, or um, an invocation in such a way, you can go through all of these different paths and reach new things that were not identified before. Um, actually, one thing that I also mentioned is uh, here in the exchange codec, at the beginning of the of the uh, flow, you can see that the deserialization protocol is also selected from um, from the header, right? So we have um, we are able to select which deserialization protocol is going to be used, and therefore we can change and force the server to not use the Hessian deserialization protocol, but instead of that, use a different protocol like the Java one or the Creo one or other ones. Actually, there is there is some code that we are not we don't have time to review, but that prevents the Java deserialization protocol from being used. But you can actually make uh, double to switch to other deserialization protocols, which are also vulnerable like Creo, uh, etc. So let me go back to the slides for a, for a second. And here we see the results that we got. So we have these CVs that were the previous one, so the ones that we were modeling with this variant analysis. Then um, we got this exchange codec, which allow us uh, to change the deserialization uh, protocol and use a different one, which uh, is also vulnerable. So it's a way of bypassing these Hessian two filters that allow developers to use a block list or an allow list. And this was identified as a CV. And then we have a bunch of different things which are also uh, unsafe or arbitrary and safe digitalization things. So these ones didn't get any CVs because uh, what well, the double maintainers uh, consider that because they have this Hessian two filter um, property, so they developers can actually enable a block list or an allow, or an allow list. They can also protect against all of these um, all of these things. But again, this is just an opt-in. It's not the enabled by default. So probably most of the um, DAO implementation, DAO installations out there are not going to be protecting neither these um, these original endpoints nor these other one endpoints. So with that, uh, well, this is the uh, DAO protocol 
um, specification. And here is what I was talking about. We can specify what is the serialization type. So changing these bits here allow us to select a different uh, serialization protocol. And by changing the request response bit, we can make this, um, this packet, this, um, this invocation as a response, even if there is no previous request, no previous invocation. And that's what I use to get remote code execution by reaching, by crafting packets that could reach behavior as a response with no previous invocation. So um, with that, I've been told that um, the closing ceremony is gonna be in a few minutes from now. So what I'm gonna to do is gonna, I'm gonna run over some of the slides without doing the exercises. Um, since you have the workshop here, what you can do is basically um, do all the exercises yourself. And I really recommend this because this is a very useful um, way of learning CodeQL. And what I'm gonna do now is basically um, explain a little bit about the exercises so you can run them on your own. So the exercise number four was about uh, finding semantic matches. And this is very useful when you are doing code review, you cannot rely purely on uh, automatic tools, right? In this case, um, the 10 tracking module uh, depends or requires models for every single node in the data flow. So if a node is not modeled in the data flow, then um, this, this path is not going to be reported. And that is uh, the same with any uh, static analysis tool. You need to model all pieces, all the APIs for which you don't have the source code. Um, even though it would be ideal to have models for every single library, every single um, third-party library and framework out there, that is not feasible. And probably there are some nodes and some APIs within your code that are not modeled. So what we want to do when doing manual code review is looking for um, semantic matches of that dangerous APIs. Like for example, if we said that the read methods of this object input type are dangerous, instead of um, relying or, the, or identifying only those where CodeQL was able to find uh, complete data flows from a source to these things, we are going to select just the invocations for these methods, right? If we do that uh, and select um, a query like this, uh, as you can see, is, is very simple. In this case, this is the model for our object input class that we had from the previous exercise. And then we have this model for the read method, which all we also have from the previous exercise. And now we are just uh, matching calls, uh, object input read calls. So regardless of having uh, data flow evidences or not. So with that, I was able to find um, 14 results. So the two first were these previous uh, decodable RPC invocation that we also, or we already mentioned. Then we have these others, which were the um, variant that we also saw in the previous exercise. Then I uh, found a new one, actually. This one was in the Redis protocol, but this one is not exported by default. Actually, this is not um, enabled. It's like death code. And from so, uh, now, like the code is right now in, in this current version of Davo, is not exported, the, the Redis protocol. So you cannot get to this sync. But if in the future they enable this Redis protocol, that can become a remote code execution uh, path. And then I found two new instances. Uh, or invoking <clears throat> these read uh, methods within the generic filters. And those were identified as new pre-authentication uh, remote code execution through Java deserialization. So when uh, analyzing the results for this previous exercise, we saw that there were not just Java native deserializations, but were some ways of getting arbitrary code execution through arbitrary setter invocation. So um, those were identified by calling the realize method in the Pollo util class and the deserialize method in the Java bean series serialized util. And then again, we wanted to know where else those methods were called because these are not uh, third party library methods, those are double methods. So maybe these are used somewhere else within the double code base 
and they are invoked using um, untrusted data. So we want to know if we can also get remote code execution through these two different vectors. And doing that, we found, um, well, the ones that we already identified in, in generic filter, but also a new one in the Telnet handler and another one in the JSON, JSON object input. Then we have uh, some of them that were used in, in the outbound filter and um, well, without the exercise and, and seeing the code is not easy to understand, but this is basically, you cannot reach this code if you cannot control the response from the, um, from the services and uh, the provider services. So uh, with that, um, another thing that I find very useful, and maybe I'm gonna do this exercise before closing, um, is using the, the things that are already modeled within CodeQL libraries in order to create heat maps of which files contain dangerous APIs. Like for example, you can do that with any um, category, like for example, uh, and save deserialization or path traversal or maybe a script injection or any one that you want. In this exercise, we are going to reuse the class uh, and save deserialization sync from the uh, and save deserialization query module in, in, um, in the CodeQL library. And what we want to do is select all the things, no matter or uh, regardless if we have a data flow from a source to that particular thing. Again, we want to find it semantically because we cannot rely on having models for every single step in the uh, data flow paths. So um, the way that you do that, uh, let me go to exercise number six, is that we are going to select the unsafe deserialization query and then reuse the unsafe deserialization sync. So let me go to uh, VS Code again. And you will find the solution for all the exercises in the exercise folder. So this was exercise number six. And what I wanted to show you here is that, well, we are reusing the things that CodeQL is already aware of. So those are the things that were either contributed by CodeQL engineers from SEML or GitHub or by community members, which contributed a lot of things like, for example, a script injection, etc. cetera. Um, if we go to the definition, remember that we can go to the definition of this class uh, with the go to definition or command B, we will see that, well, we have things for many um, deserializers like uh, JSON-IO or YAML pins here, um, Hessian, Burlap, uh, the, of course, the Java uh, native deserialization uh, and many others. But um, we, uh, you may think that, well, this is like repping for those dangerous methods, but this is um, one step farther. It's not just looking for um, invocations to those methods. It's also looking for invocation when those methods are in an insecure configuration. So just to give you an example, for example, um, the a snake YAML, the snake YAML, um, YAML library is vulnerable only if it's not called um, with a safe constructor um, um, argument to the constructor. So let me let me quickly show you. So if we go to the safe uh, snake YAML parse definition we will see that uh, well, there is a data flow involved here to identify which calls to the YAML, compose, composal, uh, load, load all, load as, and parse method are insecure. So we, it's not just grepping about these methods, it's grepping about um, or finding when these methods are invoked on an instance of a YAML object, which was created insecurely without specifying as a safe constructor as the argument to the uh, YAML class. So if we go to the exercise number six, what we are doing here is basically saying, okay, um, find me all the sync nodes for the unsafe deserialization type, no matter if we have evidences of data flow flowing from an untrusted data source to these things. We just want to see 
where these things are located in our code base. And that will give us an idea of which files we want to manually audit and, and take more, more, more care. So if we run this query, if we run this query, we will find that there are invocations to a lot of digitalization uh, methods within uh, Double. We saw the ones for native Java. We saw that uh, it's also using Creo, for example. It's also using FastJSON. And one thing that came, like, um, I was not expecting it, is like it was digitalizing some YAML files. So let me go back because we are running out of time. Let me share my slides again. And we got 40, uh, 23 results. Many of them were within this object input classes. Remember that we have this abstraction for the serializers, which have these read attachments, read object methods. And well, these classes, we already modeled them in the variant analysis and also in the semantic matches that we did in exercise number four. So we already take care of this. Then they have a bunch of them in fast JSON. Um, but fast JSON in the latest version uses a very strict block list. So they are not going to be considered as a vulnerability because, well, you need to find novel gadgets and, and that the gadget will become the, the, the vulnerability itself. And then we found three YAML, uh, snake YAML methods, which again are invoked in an insecure way. It's not just uh, gripping about the load method. It's, there are load methods that are invoked in a secure way, and there are three of them that are invoked in an insecure way. And the power of CodeQL and using these uh, sync heat maps is that we are going to get only those that are used in an insecure way. So from here, we can start pulling the thread and see where uh, the data that is passed to this method is coming from and see if we can control it. And well, that was part of the next exercises, but again, we are running out of time and we are going to skip these exercises. Uh, I recommend you to follow the, the next ex exercises, number seven and eight. And with that, I will just um, skip these uh, exercises and come back to um, this slide about contribution. So again, just remind you that by contributing queries to the GitHub, uh, well, to the CodeQL repo, uh, you will help other users find vulnerabilities, and also you will be able to get some money. I can I can show you some of the latest bounties that we have uh, given, and you can see they are very uh, generous. And and these queries are going to be useful for other people, for many users that are going to be able to find vulnerabilities just because you contributed a query. So I'm encouraging you to contribute queries and uh, get some money in the, in the way. So that was it. I'm sorry about the technical problems with um, the slides and um, VS Code and also with some problems with VS Code itself. Um, I think with that, there are four more minutes before the closing ceremony starts. So I will see you there. Uh, also, uh, they are asking me for the um, slides. I will um, put them into the repo, right? So uh, probably tomorrow or ne next week, I will update, uh, upload the slides as a PDF into the repo itself. So you will be able to find it in the um, CodeQL double workshop repo. Okay. So with that, thank you very much and see you in the closing ceremony. Thank you so much, Alvaro. Uh, so everyone, we're going to be switching to track one. So uh, the closing ceremony, ceremony is only going to be on track one. So go ahead and head over there for the closing ceremony. And thank you so much, Alvaro, for hopping on today. No problem. Thank you. All right. Bye.